I have this, the distinct pleasure of introducing to you uh, this afternoon our newest faculty member, uh, the Reverend Dr. Christine Rafado, uh, joined the faculty last summer and has had a pretty full year of teaching under her belt. Uh, we wrote the job description uh, before we went out looking uh, to include uh, doing something that now theological education is forced to do uh, uh, across the board. And that is where, where in the past seminaries could afford to have uh, specialists in every field. We now ask our professors to be a bit more general in their approach. Uh, Christine, uh, her main her doctoral work and her main competence is in Old Testament, but she also has competence in pastoral care, and so she has taught courses for us this year in both areas. Uh, but her passion is still for Old Testament. Uh, Christine has her doctorate from the University of, of uh, Marquette uh, in uh, Milwaukee, and uh, is also a uh, graduate of Luther Northwestern Theological Seminary in St. Paul and of Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota. She uh, has taught both at Marquette and at Wartburg uh, Theological Seminary in Dubuque, Iowa. Uh, and she has served as a parish pastor in Wisconsin and in Minnesota. Uh, she also served as a missionary to the Central African Republic, uh, where she taught on the faculty of the École de Théologie de l'Église Évangélique Luthérienne de la République Centrafricaine in Babua, Central African Republic. Um, so we uh, welcome uh, this afternoon the Reverend Dr. Christine Rufado. She's going to speak to us on Luther and Mary Magdalene. secondary mini doctorates also in historical theology and in systematics. And so I wrote a paper on Luther and Mary Magdalene and presented it at Marquette. And this is a rewriting of that presentation that I did for a Reformation colloquium at Marquette. Mary Magdalene, after Mary, the mother of Jesus, is the most well-known woman New Testament. The biblical witness is that Mary Magdalene was a supporter of Jesus' ministry and the first witness of the resurrection. Early Western tradition in the church identified Mary Magdalene with both Mary of Bethany and the sinful woman who washed Jesus' feet. By the Middle Ages, this composite three-in-one Mary Magdalene had become one of the most venerated saints in Europe, and she was the subject of a thriving cult in France. Mary Magdalene was honored in the Western Church as one who overcame sin. She was a repentant prostitute, an intriguing, comforting, and even titillating sinner saint, whose legend consoled but also inspired. During the Reformation, Mary Magdalene continued to be a model of contrition and conversion for the church. But she was no longer the consoler, the advocate, miracle worker, and patron that she had been during the Middle Ages. By the 16th century, Mary Magdalene was, above all, a tearful penitent, an example of Christ's love to save the most fallen of humanity. 
most of the reformers saw Mary Magdalene in her traditional role as model penitent. Martin Luther refers to Mary Magdalene only several dozen times in all of his voluminous writings. And in many respects, Luther's understanding of Mary Magdalene is limited to the accepted and traditional view of the church of his day. But Luther does lift up Mary Magdalene in some distinctive and even self-revelatory ways. Mary Magdalene is, for Luther, an important witness to the truth of the gospel. Her experience preaches salvation by grace through faith. And so this afternoon, what we're going to look at is Luther's interpretation of Mary Magdalene, her identity, and her role as a witness in the Gospels and in the life of the Church. And now I would like to just make a few concluding remarks. Um, first of all, the view of that Mary Magdalene was this composite three-in-one Mary endured in Catholicism despite numerous scholarly voices to the contrary until the Second Vatican Council of 1969. Finally, in 1969, the Catholic Church revised the calendar of the saints to say of Mary Magdalene that her day, quote, celebrated only the one to whom Christ appeared after the resurrection, and in no sense the sister of St. Martha, or the woman who was a sinner and whose sins the Lord forgave. Uh, Mary Magdalene's saint day is July 22nd. And then secondly, iconography of Mary Magdalene, the symbols with which she is represented in art. Often Mary Magdalene is pictured in art as carrying an alabaster jar. This is the jar that held <coughs> the ointment, the myrrh, the nard, used to anoint Jesus' body for his burial. Mary Magdalene is almost always represented with long hair, and usually it's red. Uh, this is actually by Donatello, and I don't know if you can see it from the back, but her entire body has sprouted hair everywhere. Uh, God has done this for Mary Magdalene to preserve her modesty. Her red hair is because red is the color that shows her status as a prostitute or sinner. Her clothes are most often red in art for the same reason. She is often painted topless or even naked. She is often shown meditating on a skull, showing her understanding of mysteries of life and death. There are also many icons of Mary Magdalene showing her carrying an egg. In Eastern tradition, Mary Magdalene went to Rome after the Ascension and was admitted to the court of Tiberius Caesar because of her high social standing. And when she was with Tiberius Caesar, she apparently told him how badly Pilate had presided over Jesus' trial. And in order to help explain Jesus' resurrection, according to the legend, Mary Magdalene took an egg that was on the table and lifted it up. And Tiberius supposedly responded by saying that a human being couldn't rise from the dead any more than that egg can turn red. And immediately, the egg turned red. And this is why in Eastern Orthodox tradition, red eggs are exchanged at Pascha, at Easter. Now some traditions say that if the story wasn't that complicated, it was just that Mary Magdalene held up the egg, a red egg, and said, Christ is risen. 
Now, Jane Scottberg is uh, a woman, a professor from, in Detroit who has written a lot about Mary Magdalene. And she said that no other biblical figure has as vivid and bizarre a post-biblical life as Mary Magdalene. According to Eastern tradition, Mary visited Christ's tomb three times, once by herself and twice with other women. She became a traveling preacher. She apparently assisted uh, John, the theologian, in Ephesus. She died peacefully and was buried in a cave, and her relics were later taken to Constantinople. Now, in France, there was a belief that kind of fostered this thriving cult that I mentioned. There was a belief that Mary Magdalene and Lazarus and another man named Maxibin left uh, Palestine and got into a boat that had no rudder and no sail. And this boat miraculously brought them to the coast of France near Arles. And so uh, this is how she came to be so important to France. They saw that she went there, and later she left that area and went to Marseille and converted the people. And there also came to be this legend that I know all of you know by now because of the Da Vinci Code, that Mary Magdalene was <coughs> pregnant with Jesus' child at the crucifixion. And then afterwards, in that very same boat, she came to France bearing the Holy Grail. And some French kings promoted this legend that the descendants of Mary Magdalene and Jesus' child were the founders of the Merovingian dynasty. And this story is revived in Wagner's opera Parsifal. Now the Gospel of Thomas has a very interesting ending. It says that Mary Magdalene must become male. And a lot of different scholars have written on this and, um, you know, trying to say that this is perhaps against women, but at least recently, April DeConnick has written that this is really an understanding that goes back to Jewish tradition, that the first human was androgynous. And so the first human, the androgynous Adam, split into two and became male and female. So at least April DeConnick is saying that for Mary to become male actually means that she, she will become what all will become, a return to pre-fall or pre-creation humanity. And that's all I have time for. <laughs> so thank you very much.